All right. Hello, my friends. We are live. I'm so excited to see you. Welcome and welcome to 2022. So I thought since we're starting out on a brand new year, it might be a good time to talk a little bit about how to get unstuck and grow your fundraising in 2022. So if we haven't met yet, my name's Emma. I help fundraisers and nonprofit leaders raise more five and six figure gifts for their mission. And if you're just joining us, I want you to go ahead, let me know where you're joining from. I would love to hear from you. And if you're catching up on the replay, go ahead and use the hashtag replay. Drop that below so that I know you joined us and you're watching us today. All right. So I am going to go ahead and get started because we have a ton to cover today. But before I do, I wanted to talk a little bit about my inspiration for talking about this. So I was reading up on some research recently. It tends to resurface around the beginning of the year every year, but it's really interesting. It's based on some research led by Wharton professor Katie Milkman and it's called the fresh start effect. And essentially what her research showed is that any time that there is a specific event date that comes around, for example, it could be a birthday, an anniversary, or the start of a new year, this can actually enable you to be more effective at making lasting behavioral change. Now, I know this year, has been off to a pretty tough start for a lot of us. May feel a little bit more like Groundhog Day than a fresh start at this point. But I feel like that's why it's even more important for us to reset and refocus and have a look at how we can uh, bring greater ease into our work, uh, reduce friction, and as a result, grow our fundraising in 2022. So there's been quite a bit of backlash I've noticed lately about New Year's resolutions. And I want you to go into the session today, have some slides I'm going to share with you, and some key questions I'm going to walk through to help you go through the exact same process I use whenever I'm feeling stuck and I want to kind of reset and refocus again. So I use this very process myself this year and I think it's really important, right? It's really important despite the, some of the backlash that New Year's resolutions have gotten, that does not have to be painful necessarily to make a change in our behavior, right? And in fact, sometimes this can be about, as I said, making life easier, reducing friction, doesn't have to necessarily be something huge and painful that you're leaping into right now. Because I know for a lot of us, we're struggling, right? We're right back where we were, say, even a year ago. For many folks, I know that you may have your kids back at home. You may be back onto online learning. We're facing a lot of ongoing challenges. So I really want you to think about this. You know, think about this as a way, a process in which you can go to to bring a little bit more ease into your life and into your fundraising, right? Doesn't need to be big, doesn't need to be painful. So with that, I want to go ahead and get started. If you're just joining us, go ahead and say hello. Let me know where you're joining from. If you're use, if you're watching the replay, go ahead and use the hashtag replay because I always love to see who's joining us. And this is totally interactive. So if you've got any questions, if you've got any comments, go ahead and drop those below as well. I am here to help you get unstuck and grow your fundraising in 2022. All right, with that, I am going to go ahead and bring up my slides that I prepared for you today. So this, as I mentioned before, is the very process that I actually use. Hello, Sarah. Oh, nice to see you. Sarah is joining us from London. So this is the exact process that I used this year. So I'm going to be walking us through and sharing some examples here. Hi, Candice. Great to see you. I'm going to be using some examples actually from myself and my own, uh, you know, my own personal goals that I'm working on right now. And before we wrap up, I'm also going to walk you through, I'm going to recap everything, look at all the questions I share and walk you through a fundraising example as well. So 
as I said, go ahead and, uh, and drop a comment or a question below at any time. But my first question for you is, as we start off on this brand new year, what do you want to leave behind? What do you want to leave behind as we begin the new year? Now, here's a way to help you frame it. This could be a habit. It could be a belief or it could be an identity, or maybe it's all of those wrapped into one, as you'll see when I start talking about my personal example. So something that I'm really working on this year is creating better boundaries around work. Now, does that resonate with anybody? I know as we've been working from home during the pandemic, it's become increasingly difficult. And I find that those boundaries have really blurred and I found it's had an impact on all sorts of areas of my life. So I had a specific example that I'm working on. It's a habit I got into last year and that is checking email and social media right before bed. <laughs> it's a habit I got into and I found myself I found myself every night before it was time to bed just to go to bed just thinking, oh, I've just got to check in on my email in case somebody needs me, in case there's a client emergency, you know, in case there's a new development I have to check in on. And I was finding the impact of that habit was actually detrimental in a lot of ways, not just to, you know, not just to my health and my rest, but also it was impacting how effective I was during the day, how creative I was at work, you know, how present I was for my clients and my students. Right. So this is something this is a great example, right, of how we can introduce behavioral changes that actually like bring more ease and reduce friction. Right. That's a that's a good example, which is why I want to share that. Candace is sharing. Yes. After nearly two years, I'm struggling with work life boundaries. You are not alone. I think all of us especially with the shift to working from home for a lot of us, this has been so, so challenging, right? So this is what I'm working on this year. And let me tell you, I am four days in, and this is tough, right? Because I am breaking a habit, I'm breaking a habit. And there's also belief underlying this, right? If you scratch the surface of some habits like this one, there is a belief right there. What was my belief there is that something urgent might be going on that needs my attention. There is also perhaps an identity wrapped up in this. And you may also identify with this concept if you're someone who's front facing and working with donors, right? My identity there is, you know, oh, I'm someone who is available for my clients. I'm someone who's very responsive. I'm someone who's going to, you know, email back right away so they know how important they are to me. So the, these are this is a good example of how these things can get tangled up, but end up creating habits that actually don't serve us well. And in fact, ultimately undermine, right? So what's my belief? I want to serve my clients. I want to be present for my clients. I want to be helpful. But in fact, what this habit of checking email and social media before bed was turning into was impacting my rest, impacting my sleep, because it never ever was checking my email, it would turn into doom scrolling, <laughs> turn into doom scrolling on social media and ended up getting me, you know, ended up really impacting my rest, my sleep. So that's just something I'm working on right now. And as a great example, this is something I want to leave behind as we begin the new year. All right, so, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, so here's a prompt for you. If you're having a little bit of difficulty here, perhaps you want to do, you want to do something like me and, and kind of reestablish those work-life boundaries with a new habit. Perhaps you want to stop an old habit, but here's a prompt for you if you're struggling with what do you wanna leave behind as we begin this new year? Just think about what steals my time and sucks my energy. That's a really good place to start, right? It's a really good place to start. And I think it fits really nicely in, um, you know, with the fact that a lot of us are in struggle right now, right? I mentioned if you are at home and you do have your kids at home or you're just feeling isolated because you're in an area that's kind of locked down again due to the pandemic, right? It's really important not to set ourselves up for failure, not to sort of take on these punitive, I think that's why New Year's resolutions sometimes get a bad name, 
taking on like these punitive, um, really difficult um, things that we want to change. But these, in fact, can be things that smooth the way, right, that don't need to be huge. You can just think about like, what is stealing my time and sucking my energy? Doom scrolling and social media is right up there for a lot of folks. Now, this is not to say breaking that habit is easy. <laughs> I've been grappling with myself every night. I get that urge right before bed. I said, like, oh, I just I want to check in so bad. But as we move on to the next slide, you'll see how I handle that. Uh, but it's so worthwhile, right? And for you, maybe something different, maybe something similar. But I want you to think about what do you want to leave behind? And what is stealing your time and sucking your energy, right, that you want to leave behind in 2021? All right. Now, the flip side of this is what do you want more of in 2022? And here's a hint. So the answers to question one, what do you want to leave behind? And question two, often can be connected, right? For me, they're definitely connected because one thing I really want more of in 2022 is more restorative rest, okay? So I've realized how important, <laughs> after many, many years of overwork, how important truly restorative rest is. So those two are connected for me because my breaking the habit of checking email and social media and doom scrolling before bed was impacting that restorative rest. So now that I am breaking that habit, I can actually, you know, I can actually get better sleep and get more restorative rest. And this is where habits, beliefs, and identities come in here too, because what can be really helpful if these two things are connected for you, like they are for me, is just to, to think about creating new habits and new beliefs. I'm actually actively working on and repeating a new belief that's related to restorative rest. I'm still not 100% behind this, but I think if I repeat it often enough, it's going to sink in. And that is that rest is equally important as work. Rest is equally important as work. So that's a new belief that I'm working on <laughs> installing after many, many years of overwork, right? So it's also coupled with a habit. I've got a new habit now, which is at the end of my work day, I schedule in a work day shutdown, right? And of course, if there is a true emergency or if there truly is a scheduling reason that I should be working in the evening, for example, I'm doing a, you know, a board training or something else that has to happen in the evening, great. I can schedule that in advance, you know, the occasional true emergency I can deal with that. But outside of that, I have a time at which I shut down for the day. I do a work day shutdown. And that's it. I'm done for the day. The lid to the laptop gets closed. That is a new habit that I'm using to support stopping the stopping the doom scrolling and stopping the email checking outside of work hours, right? So there you go. That's something that you can think about, something that might help you as well. And you've also got to think about identity here as well. This is where things can get tricky. Let's say you do want to create greater work-life boundaries all sorts of beliefs and identity issues can come up when you're thinking about this, right? It's like what I, I explained in the beginning, talking about this idea of, you know, I'm the kind of person, I'm the kind of entrepreneur that will, you know, be very responsive, be, you know, responding immediately, immediately supporting my clients when they need this. But when I really sat down and examined that belief, my behaviors were undermining that. My behaviors and my overworking and my not getting enough restorative rest was actually impacting my ability to show up and be truly present for my clients, to be creative and to bring my best self to work when I was at work. So if you are in that habit of, you know, being immediately responsive, if you are in that habit of you know sending emails at 2 a.m um something to think about right it's something to think about so think about that think about the habit the belief and the identity that need to kind of go in to support whatever you want in more of in 2022 all right so let's move on to question number three and that is why is this important to you so I want to talk a little bit about two types of motivation. This can be really helpful to be aware of when you are trying to change a behavior, right? The first is 
extrinsic motivation, right? So extrinsic motivation is coming from outside of you, right? Makes sense. It's an external gain, or it could be a loss as well. It's very motivating for us if there's some sort of consequence that we perceive. It could be a gain of money, an increase of salary, an increase of title. That's extrinsic motivation to make a change. Intrinsic motivation is more of an internal reward, right? It can be satisfaction, a sense of challenge. It can be joy or a sense of connection. Now, the key here to really making any changes stick is to focus in on that intrinsic motivation. Search that out in yourself as what is the internal reward that you're looking for when you want to make this change? <clears throat> for me, breaking my habit of checking email at night and getting more restorative rest, the internal reward for me is really about, you know, it's about a sense of satisfaction. It is about being able to connect more effectively with the people I work with, to be more present with those people, right? And how important adequate rest and adequate boundaries are to supporting that. So think about that if you wanna make a change. What is that intrinsic motivation? It's more important, external rewards are great, but if you really want to affect change, true change, especially tricky change, like big habit change, intrinsic motivation is super important, okay? And here's a hint, right? If you're sort of seeking out that intrinsic motivation, it's pretty much always connected to feelings, right? It's connected to feelings and how you are going to feel when you achieve uh, the thing you want to achieve, right? And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be life-changing. You know, like I said, it could simply be satisfaction. Or for those of us who are fundraisers, if you're watching this, and trust your fundraising in some capacity, right is that connection that connection to others that relationship building right is like that is a feeling as well the feeling of, of true and meaningful connection with our donors we'll be talking about that a little more in a moment right is like that's great intrinsic motivation right and i know it's something that's really motivated me throughout my fundraising career so think about that if you are struggling sort of find and hone in on that intrinsic motivation for a change that you want to achieve when you're thinking about why this is important to you to achieve this change, think about that intrinsic motivation. All right. And listen, if you're just joining us or if you've been here since the beginning, don't be shy. Go ahead. Drop your questions below. If there's anything you're really struggling with, you want support on, let us know. And yeah, I'd love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you because I am here to help. I know a lot of us are feeling really stuck right now. And this is a great opportunity to get unstuck and gain some momentum, which we're going to be talking about in this fourth and final question, which is what action will you need to take, right? What action will you need to take to move this change forward? So I want to recommend to you committing to an action and scheduling it in your calendar. This is what I did when I decided to break that habit of nighttime bedtime email checking is that I actually scheduled in my workday shutdown. I've got a very clear time at which I do this in, in, unless there's some sort of very serious emergency. I've got workday shutdown scheduled. It's in my calendar. So it's very clear when it's time to wrap up and I'm developing that new habit and I'm reminded every day when that comes up in my calendar, right? So here is the great thing. If you set and take an action consistently, even a small one, I want you to know how small is that, that I've scheduled in my calendar that I'm shutting my laptop at a certain time every day, right? Very small action. But when I do that consistently, when you do, when you schedule and do any action, even a small one consistently, you will create something that is so helpful to get unstuck. And that is momentum right? That is momentum. Even after a few days of very, very small, small actions, I want to emphasize this. It doesn't need to be huge. In fact, I want to recommend that you start off thinking about small actions instead of, for example, let's say, as we're going to be walking through a fundraising example in one moment, you would like to have more meaningful conversations with your donors. Instead of committing to schedule out a whole day every week and perhaps setting yourself up to fail it for failure, just start small, right? Start small. You could say, 
okay, I'm going to schedule in a small time block every week. Maybe it's an hour or I'm going to, I'm going to set myself a goal and schedule into my calendar that I am going to connect with and have a meaningful conversation with one donor every week. And this can really have a tremendous compounding effect, right? So small actions that are easy to achieve, that are easy to schedule in, that you do consistently are actually a whole lot better than being overambitious, scheduling something in that you just don't end up doing so that you end up not getting that momentum. So if you do want to get unstuck and get momentum, I really recommend that you think small, think small, Think of an action that you can schedule and commit to no matter where your life is right now, right? If, especially if you've got a lot of pressure on you, if, you've, if you're juggling a lot of things, if you're at that point where a lot of parents are right now, I know, um, you know, we are just at that point where you're absolutely burnt out, right? Is to just think small. Maybe you do want to think like I did and say, my thinking is I'm going to schedule in and shut down that laptop, right? And I'm going to really examine my beliefs around why or why not I do that, right? And I'm really going to get clear on what is my intrinsic motivation for wanting to shut that laptop down and wanting to make sure that I improve those boundaries around my, uh, you know, around my work. All right. So I hope this has been helpful. I'm going to walk you through, got all the questions on one slide. I'm going to walk you through a fundraising example really quickly, just so it's clear. And I want to invite you as well, if you're watching, go ahead and let me know if you've got a question or if there's a change you want to implement or if there's a way in which you are looking to get unstuck when it comes to your fundraising, because I'm here to help. All right. So let's go back to the beginning. What do you want to leave behind as we begin the new year? I'm going to walk through an example here using something that I hear from a lot of fundraisers and nonprofit leaders, and that is that they're really, really tired of working reactively and being constantly in crisis mode. Okay. That may resonate with you as well. So let's say that's something you want to leave behind as we begin the new year. I want to stop working reactively. I want to stop. I want to get out of crisis mode. I want to leave that behind in 2021. Working reactively is a last year thing, right? What you want more of in 2022, that could be related as well, right? Let's say you're moving from just reacting to things as they come up, not being strategic, not necessarily being focused in a particular area for strategic growth in your fundraising. Let's say, again, drawing on a very common example I hear from my students and my coaching clients, a lot of fundraisers are working on this idea of having more meaningful conversations with their donors. So let's say you want more meaningful conversations with your donors in 2022. So let's think about this, right? It's like, what is the, what are your motivations around this, right? Is like, is like, what are your habits around this? What are your beliefs related to having more meaningful conversations with our donors? This could be something you need to sit down and think through and examine. If you want more meaningful conversations with your donors, what's getting in the way of that right now? So let's think about that. It could, for example, be a belief. It could be a belief that my donors don't want to have meaningful conversations with me. It could be a belief that, oh, my donors are busy. I don't want to interrupt them. I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to call and catch them at an awkward time. So just have a look at what do you want more of and what might actually be getting in the way of that, right? And I think this is when you bring all of this into number three and talk about that. Why is this important to you? What is the intrinsic motivation? And there can be an extrinsic motivation there as well, right? Maybe you do want to raise more money. You want to exceed all of your fundraising goals this year. You want to land the biggest gift that you've ever landed in your career. That's great too, but dig a little deeper and let's have a look at what some of the intrinsic motivation behind that is, right? That could truly be a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction, right? Is like landing that biggest gift of your career. There's major intrinsic motivation as well. For me, my front facing donor work, the intrinsic motivation I had was I had got so much joy. I got so much joy out of 
truly meaningful, deep connections with my donors, right? Those conversations when we actually started digging into like values, right? And motivations and, you know, what was their most heartfelt reason for supporting um, the mission that we were working to achieve together. That's massive intrinsic motivation. So I really want you to think more about that. <clears throat> no matter what your goal is that's related to fundraising growth, again, it can be very small. Uh, think about what your intrinsic motivation is beyond exceeding the goal. What's really, what's the feeling behind that, right? What is motivating that? What is the intrinsic motivation behind uh, what you might want more of in 2022? Finally, let's talk about what action you might need to take. So I want to stop being reactive. I want to stop working in crisis mode. I want to start being more strategic in my fundraising. I want to start having more meaningful conversations with my donors. This is important to me for a few reasons because I want to, you know, I want to be successful. I want it. I want to exceed my goals. That's going to help. That's going to make me feel really satisfied. It's going to give me a great sense of achievement. Perhaps even more important, I know I'm going to get that joy, that joy that I feel when I do have those really deep and meaningful connections with my donors, those meaningful conversations. That is a joyful, joyful moment for me. Great intrinsic motivation. So what action am I going to need to take if I do want to have more meaningful conversations with my donors and get more of that joy from that kind of connection. And I think I also go back to this idea of scheduling really small actions right into your calendar. And again, this is totally scalable depending upon where you're at. You might be a major gift specialist. You might be able to focus much more of your time on having more meaningful conversations with your donors, in which case, you might have a couple actions you want to take. You might want to schedule more time into your calendar and make sure you're protecting and honoring that time for calling your donors. You may want to, you know, improve your skills, do some professional development and training around major gifts. But perhaps you are doing some major gifts off the side of your desk. You can also schedule in commitments that really work for you, right? It does again, it doesn't need to be setting yourself up for failure, saying, I'm going to work 50% of my time this week on major gifts. If that truly is not realistic for you, you might set a goal like I had previously mentioned. You might say, well, what I'd love to do is just have, you know, call one donor a week. It's my, my goal to call one donor a week to have a meaningful conversation with them, right? So, you know, speaking of compound effects, if you are somebody who it doesn't have as much time, you're doing this off the side of your desk, Here's a great example. If you do this over the course of a year, let's say hopefully you're on vacation for at least a couple of weeks, you could have as many as 50 meaningful donor conversations by the end of the year. So I really want you to think about how even manageable commitments can really add up to have a huge impact and a huge compound effect, especially in terms of building that momentum, right? That's what we want. If we want to get unstuck, we need to take action to build momentum, right? And those actions need to be achievable. They can be a little bit aspirational too, right? But you don't want to set yourself up for something you're not going to be able to achieve. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, and I want to hear from you. Is anyone inspired? Have you made a decision around what you want more of in 2022? And what action, even if it's one small one, are you going to take to get unstuck and build more momentum in your fundraising this year. Go ahead, don't be shy, drop that below and let me know. I'd love to hear from you. And also, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop those as well. If you are um, struggling with anything in particular, uh, go ahead and share that. Don't be shy because we are here to help. I'm gonna take a quick sip of my water um, and give you some time to enter that in as well. Because I've been talking a lot today. All right. And even if you just want to take these questions away and work on these yourself, these can be really helpful. If you're not someone who does journaling, this can be really helpful to write out on, right? Or, or just, just to be like 
sit down and just unfiltered, write your answers to these questions. Nobody else needs to see them, can just be for your eyes only. Um, but this has been a really helpful process. And this is the exact process I myself follow when I'm thinking about, you know, changing a behavior, um, making a habit change, growing something. Sarah says, number one, I overpromise and want to reduce what I promise so I can accomplish more. I love that. I love that. So that's a great one to take away to say, you know, how can I, when I look at this, if I want to leave over promising behind, and if I want to, you know, reduce what I want to promise to accomplishment, how, how do I leave that behind? And what on the flip side might that mean more of? What do I want more of um, in 2022, right? So working through these questions, I think, could be really, really helpful and why this is important. Just even from a habit perspective, uh, a belief perspective, an identity perspective. I think a lot of folks may identify with this idea. A lot of fundraisers may identify with this belief around, especially if we're in major gifts, I have to be available all the time for my donors. I have to also be perfect <laughs> at all times for my for my donors. Um, and these are some things to dig, dig a little bit deeper into because I find those are ideas that can really get you stuck, right? If you are stuck in that place of thinking, everything has to be perfect if I'm working in major gifts and I have to be responsive all the time at all hours of the day, that it is actually having an impact on how effective you are when you are connecting with your donors. So really interesting when you start digging into that. But I love that. That is a great thing to be working on um, and well done because I think a lot of us do this. We overpromise. Right. And, and what we really want to do is um, probably just make sure that we're making commitments and that we're being good to our word. But what that means is, is that we maybe need to make fewer commitments and, and promise few promise fewer things. Right. So it can be very challenging. Right. The shutdown idea. Yes. I'm glad that resonates with folks. Having a shutdown ritual for me, that's been really, really helpful. So Sarah has a question. What goes into the shutdown? Um, is to list what I accomplished and what remained undone. I like that. In fact, I love the idea of listing your accomplishments and your wins for the day. That is an amazing shutdown rich ritual. Um, what you put into the shutdown could be very specific to you. I will share my particular shutdown ritual, which is it's fairly similar. So I usually have three big things I want to accomplish in a day. Not all is necessarily really big. For example, coming live with you is one of my big three things that I want to accomplish today. So I typically have three things I want to accomplish in a work day. So when I'm shutting down, I look at those. I see, did I finish them? Not necessarily always. Do I need to carry something over for tomorrow? So that's my process. I may, uh, I also um, don't, I'm not always in my email. This is another thing that's really important. So I check in on my email, on my Slack, anything that you have that's an internal communication system. Um, I will check in on those um, periodically during the day, but I always reserve, um, I always reserve time, I always reserve focus time to work on my biggest priorities. I'm not always in my inbox. I'm not always in my Slack. So I check those things before and respond ideally before I shut down. And I have a new, this is not for everybody, but I have a new thing that I'm testing out as a part of my workday shutdown. I will do all of this. I'll be clear on what needs to be prioritized for tomorrow. I may also create my, my three things I need to accomplish for the next day. Physically actually like shut down my laptop lid, which is good. It puts something on top of it. So it's there's a little bit of a beard opening it up again. And one thing I've done, which as I said, is not for everybody, but I will go and do a short um, meditation, right? A 10 minute meditation at the end of the day. That could be whatever, but some sort of break between the busyness of the work day. For some people, like a quick walk might work. Um, if you're testing out something like, like mindfulness meditation, so many great apps out there. I use one called 10% Happier and they've got a ton of amazing, you know, and it's very research based <laughs> because I'm not somebody who, you know, I'm not, I, I am definitely somebody who is more research based kind of, kind of person than a, 
um, you know, than a, oh, I'll say woo woo. <laughs> I'm not a woo woo person, but I love this because it's just like a chance to like reconnect with myself, to disconnect from the work day and just to kind of uh, create a break. But however you create that break, it could be a walk. Um, it could be a brief meditation, um, whatever works for you, but just having some sort of ritual that helps you transition from the work day to um, your, you know, to your life after work. I think that's really, really helpful and really important right now, because otherwise those lines blur. And as I said, you are simply not going to be um, rested. You're not going to be effective. You're, you're going to really be sort of deepening your own struggle when we don't have boundaries between work and life. And this, this isn't, this is not something everyone agrees with, but I truly do believe in this. So yeah, do create your own work day, work day, uh, work day shutdown ritual, whatever works for you. You can physically close something. If you have an office, if you can physically close the door, that's great. If you don't have an office, maybe you can physically close the laptop, put something on top of it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that like even, even thinking about hobbies as well, I'm going to make a totally nerdy admission right now, but I learned to knit quite a while ago. And so I've started working on small projects and I do that in the evening. Sometimes I just knit my sister-in-law a hat <laughs> and it's been amazing because it's just a completely different set of skills. And if I find it very restful and I find it a useful way to disconnect in the evening, again, if you've got small children at home, having a knitting project on the go might not be for you, but do think about what works for you. I think that's really important. Maureen saying, thanks for sharing your workday shutdown ritual. Please do. I'm so glad to hear you're inspired to develop and commit to your own. I thought this may resonate with folks because I think a lot of us are struggling with very similar things right now is the blurring of lines between work and life, right? So, and as an entrepreneur, I get it, right? I can't necessarily work nine to five. You're probably the same as a fundraiser or a nonprofit leader. But that's not to say that we completely throw all boundaries out the window, right? We create new boundaries that work well for us and we make sure that we prioritize rest. Maybe you want to work on that belief like I'm working on that belief is that rest is equally important as work. I may get to the point where I say rest is even more important than work, but I'm not quite there yet. So I want to thank you for joining me. Oh my goodness, we've been chatting now for almost 35 minutes. I really hope you found this helpful. Oh, and before I go, I want to encourage you, if you enjoyed today and if you want to dive a little bit deeper into fundraising, into growing your major gifts, I want to invite you to my free masterclass. We've actually just put this onto uh, on demand. So there's all sorts of times available that suit you well. It's called How to Raise Six-Figure Donations for Your Mission. If you haven't checked this out yet, you can sign up by going to majorgiftmasterclass.com forward slash go. And I'll be sharing lots of ideas for you about how to grow your major gift fundraising in 2022. Maureen, also, I'm such a 10% happier app fan. I love them. Um, so I'm glad to see there are other users there as well. But definitely, you know, I think it's really good, especially if you're new to um, this idea of meditation. It's fantastic. And I know they're actually doing a, a challenge right now. So I think that you can actually access that 10 day challenge without even subscribing. So Candace has is just sharing something. I'll share this before I wrap up. <clears throat> just looking back over the past year, big drain on time and energy was constantly having to, you know, get folks in the organization on board with fundraising efforts. We, we've all experienced that. If you're at an organization where, you know, our program folks, our board members totally on board with our fundraising efforts. Um, but yeah, if that's something that you find is really uh, draining your energy is impacting it, you want to leave it behind. That's a great something to work on. Um, is that how do you move away from um, the sense of like struggle to get folks on board around around fundraising um, and also recognizing here's something important I'll say before I wrap up as well what is within your control and what is outside of your control 
Um, and I think that's something useful to reflect on as well. And perhaps that's a key here as well, is that is that sometimes, right, other people's thoughts, other people's feelings around fundraising may not be inside your control, may not be part, may, may not be within your control. So you could think about what am I in control of? What can I influence that may change this, right? Because sometimes that's where the draining comes from is that, you know, we want to change something that's outside of our control. Um, so do you think about that if that is something that's been draining you as recognizing what is inside your control? What is outside of your control? Um, I know it's frustrating for all of us, any other type A personalities out there. Um, it's frustrating sometimes to think it's like, oh, I'm recognizing that oftentimes things are outside of my control. Great example right now, whatever state you're in, in terms of the lockdown around the pandemic, in terms of homeschooling, um, much of it outside of our control, right? So um, just recognizing that and, and thinking about what is in, in our control right now, what can we influence, right? Um, and and really being realistic about that can definitely be a relief because I think there's all sorts of ways to influence, um, you know, to do some cultural change work. We might not be able to delve totally deeply into this today, but if you're looking to change the culture at your organization, there may very well be lots of great things you can do that are within your control, um, that you can exert your influence on your colleagues. Um, but maybe that's another live, uh, if there's enough interest in that, because um, I need to wrap up right now at the 40 minute mark, but uh, let us continue our conversation. I'm really grateful for you to join us today. and. I'll be going live for the next few weeks, actually, in January. So uh, keep a lookout for uh, my next upcoming live. I'm going to be talking about all sorts of things related to your fundraising and your major gift fundraising. And if you haven't had a ch chance to check out my On Demand Masterclass, go ahead and sign up. I would love to see you there. So thank you, everybody. And I will talk to you soon. It's been a pleasure spending time with you today. All right. Bye-bye. Good luck with everything. And I'd love to hear from you. I want to know, what are you working on? Even if you drop me a line um, or share this, uh, share this uh, after the live's wrapped up, let me know what you're working on and uh, if you found this session helpful for you. We'll talk to you soon.